I want to talk about a side project I've been doing on image captioning. And I'm currently a backend engineer in Coffee Means Bagel, but I have an enthusiast about machine learning. So image captioning is to add a sentence, give an image to output a sentence to describe the image. So why is it hard? It's because you not only have to recognize the object in the image, you also have to learn the relationship between them. And also, the sentence you output has to have gram grammar structure, grammar stru structure, so that's hard as well. And so in order to be able to generate this script sentence for it, our model must meet several requirements. And the model should be able to extract high-level concepts of image, such as the scene, the color, or position of objects in the image. And so I decided to use a convolutional neural network to extract the image feature out. And also, the model should be able to generate a sentence so I use via, via current neural network, which like incorporate the time factor of the sentence to generate the next word based on the current words. And the length of the caption also may vary. We have short sentence, long, long sentence. So our model must be able to know where to stop. So we will add a special end token at the end of the sentence during training. And also we need to know when to start. So we will also use a special start token. So besides from um, incorporate the each vocabulary of the sentence using like naive number from one to five thousand, for example, if we have five thousand vocabulary, we can use um, pre-trained word embedding to encode the, each vocabulary, so that we can also have the relationship between each word. So in word embedding, we will project each vocabulary into a high-dimensional space, which incorporate the relationship between each vocabulary. So like, for example, in the left most figure, it will, word embedding will project men and women to that, to the position. And you can see that the relationship of man to woman is similar to king or queen. So it was capturing some of the, like the gender info and a lot of other things. So it's really interesting and it will do much better to just uh, embed the word with like one to 5,000. So basically, this is what the models look like. On the left-hand side, you can see, so we fit in the sentence, for example, a cat on the grass, and then we do word embedding, and then we fit in the image, and we uh, concate them together, and then we fit them a lot of these like, image and sentence pair, and hopefully at the end, the model will learn that if you give it a new image, it will output a sentence to describe the image. And this is the first version of result I got. It was pretty funny. So this is a picture of a bunch of people. So the ground truth caption I fit in is a man holding his hand. Oh, sorry, this is wrong caption. So uh, like for some of this one, a man holding his hand in the air. And the ma machine was saying a player, a player, a player, a player, a player. So it kind of gets something, but it's like cannot stop itself from talking like a naggy grandma. So we, we need to find some way to fix this, right? And yeah, it's also like output some really like unrelated vocabulary, like for some this like some boat, but it, the generator caption is like mirror hand roof, which is unrelevant at all. Maybe a little bit, it, it looks a little bit like rooftop. So I look at the, um, the loss function, the loss, the loss uh, graph. So the training loss, the red line is saying how how bad this model is doing on training data, which is those image that we fit the model to train it. So you can see the red, red line is really low, which means that uh, it was predict really good uh, on training data, but if you fit the model with unseen picture, for example, that like a picture you've never seen before, and the blue line is really high, which means that it's, it's doing really badly on image that you have never seen before which is like the previous three two picture that we fit to the model. So although you can, it can predict really good on picture that have already seen, but it's doing poorly on new data. But this is not what we want, right? Because if we train a machine learning model, we want it to be able to perform well on data that have never seen. So, um, so it's probably because like the, the op numeric optimization algorithm is suffering from some cliff-like structure on the a uh, loss function surface. So we can try to like decrease, I, I decrease the learning rate and then do some gradient clipping to prevent the optimization algorithm to like go to somewhere really far and get stuck. So it's always a good practice to tune your numeric optimizer on small data first to get the good run learning rate and before launching the, the full algorithm and then to do like costly full data training.
Yeah. And this is some like good results. You can see a young baby, young boy is holding a baseball bat, but it's closer. Thank you, Katie. Yeah. Woo! All right. Our next speaker is Salar. Yes. Amazing friend of the community. Oh, I've got this wrong side, have I? Yeah. We really like Salah. We do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting worried. There's too many nice things being said about me. Yeah. <laughs> Here, I've, I've got one. I've got one. Um, I was told I needed to tell jokes while they figured out the AV. So uh, when do you know a joke is a dad joke? All right. I think we're good. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> when it's apparent. Oh, all right. <laughs> Salah. Great, hi. Uh, hello, hi everyone. Uh, can you hear me, hear me okay? Yeah. Great, good news. Uh, I'm Salora Manian from, uh, I work for Maya. We're building a our recruiting agent. Uh, we're, we are looking for Python developers. A quick shameless plug there. If you want to know more about it, come and ask me because I haven't got much time here. Um, uh, today I'm going to uh, talk to you about PyEnv. Uh, within the Python community, we have many uh, tools we use to create a virtual environment so that we can run multiple projects on our laptop uh, using different versions of Python. My favorite uh, it, it happens to be PyEnv. Some of the other ones you may have come across are VirtualEnv, PyPenv by the famous Kenneth Wright. Uh, Python 3 has his own VM and uh, an, an old favorite one, uh, uh, VirtualEnv wrapper. Uh, so, uh, I didn't have much time to prepare anything uh, too much, so what I'm hoping to do is uh, do a quick demo of how easy it is to use PyEnv to create a virtual environment. So PyEnv, uh, you install it on the command line. It's a simple one-line in, uh, in install command to install it. Um, is that big enough, by the way? Yeah. Uh, uh, it, it's a simple one-line in install command uh, using brew on your Mac. Uh, to install it, um, it's basically PyEnv, and it's actually two modules: is PyEnv and PyEnv. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah. It's Py PyEnv and uh, Py uh, Py 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 PyEnv uh, Virtual Env. Uh, I'm not going to actually run the command because I've already installed it. Um, once you inst once you install it, you can have a look at uh, what. Uh, a versions of uh, Python is available to you uh, by just doing a simple pyenv install list command that tells you every single version of Python that it can find. Uh, so let's say we want to install the very latest version of uh, uh, Py Python 3.7.0 on our laptop. What we need to do is first install the version first, and then we can create the virtual ends. So just as a one-off task, uh, I would do uh, pyenv install uh, followed by their version number. And that would go off and build Python 3.7. It takes a bit of time, so I've already installed it uh, because we, we, we were short of time. Uh, once, the, once it is installed, to create, uh, I've uh, cloned a project, a side project of mine I'm doing for my father-in-law. Uh, he, he owns a restaurant called Cafe Renaissance. Uh, it's a Python Django project. Uh, so for that, I, I want to create a virtual environment uh, based on that. So I would do PyEnv, virtual env. Um, and, and, and I would give it a name, so Cafe. Ren, yeah? And the, the Cafe Ren will be the name of my virtual env with th version 3.7.0 will be the version it's going to use. Uh, within minutes, uh, this one I'll actually will run. Um, uh, there you go, it's created it. And uh, what I do is it's got this nice command called pyenv local. And uh, notice that I'm in, the, in my project root directory. Uh, and then I, I type in the name of my uh, virtual env, which I created, which is Cafe Ren, and that means that whenever I enter this, uh, the, the director of my project, it automatically enables this virtual end for me. And now I can um, do pip install and everything I want to um, uh, uh, with the correct version of Python. And if, you, if, I, if I do version, you'll see that it's, an, it's now the, the version three, Python 3.7.0 and, um, and not the default Mac one that ships, which is version 2.7. Uh, there, there are more cool things, there, there are more cool things um, about PyM that I quite like, uh, but, uh, but I do know the fact that we're going to go over time because we have too many lightning talks lined up, so I'm going to uh, um, uh, 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 finish, finish off here as uh, I don't think I've got more time. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry if I was too rushed. I'll do a four hour one next time, yeah? <laughs> Thank you so much, Raul. All right. So our next speaker is Sean. 
Let's give a warm round of applause for Sean. Sean is a really, has been helping out with Pi Bay so much. <laughs> I'm glad uh, it's useful, you know, I'm never really sure. It is definitely. And he's going to tell us about understanding large code bases. Is that correct? No. No. Oops. <laughs> I think you know better than me. That, that's the other guy's presentation. <laughs> All right. OK. Um, you have five minutes. It's as soon as it's up there. But my mouse is not there. It goes. All right. OK, so I've got five minutes. I wanted to switch things up a little bit. Nobody ever talks about how in the world you communicate data science. How do you talk about it? How do you get your message out there? Uh, if you've got a specific product, how do you sell that product? If you've got an idea, how do you communicate that idea? If you need to build a team, how do you sell somebody on, uh, on the idea so that way they give their uh, uh, ideas and you know you've got this great idea, whatever it may be. You know anybody want to share one? I know this guy's got a whole bunch, but uh, uh, who's got an idea? Raise your hand that you've had recently that you've been looking to tell people about. Uh, he started to raise your hand. No. Yeah. What's what's your idea? Uh, well, let me think about it. <laughs> uh, my idea is about you know uh, use AI to uh, graphic uh, you know to draw the like a cartoon pictures. And sharing, I mean, for companies uh, who has uh, like a large photo basis, that you don't have to, you can reuse one picture will become like a 100 pictures royalty free. So because this is lightning talk, I'll stay with uh, AI to draw cartoons, right? So it gives it a little bit of context. That right there is a first step. Give it context. A lot of times as engineers, we like to think in terms of these abstract terms, bring it down to reality, right? And has anybody here ever been called introverted? Yeah, as soon as anybody finds out I'm in tech, they call me introverted. They don't know me very well. Um, so I have created data man, or data woman, or data girl, or whatever your preference is. But we should not be afraid to express ourselves, because we're not introverted. They're probably just kind of boring. Um, so once you have this idea and you want to do your AI for drawing cartoons and stuff like this, you need to go and find an audience, somebody who understands you, somebody who uh, hears what you're trying to say, somebody who has a history with things, whether you do that um, in person or you do it on the computer. Finding the right people is really difficult. This conference is an uh, example of finding good people, right? Um, you come to this talk, right, because you're looking for people who might be speaking about quick things. You go to the AI talk for another reason. Maybe you'll run into somebody that has that sort of background. These are ways of searching for stuff, right? But you have to find things. If you go to meetups, if you go to, if you host those meetups. Once you're there and you find the right person, right, there's different ways to try to, you know, we, you can do the hover kind of around the conversation and hope that it, you know, goes into something interesting. You can uh, cold call, right? Right, everybody's seen the movie Boiler Room? It's, uh, it's an older movie. They just, all they do is pump and dump stocks and they cold call people like crazy, convince them. That's the negative thing, all the recruiters that are calling you all the time. You can also have the warm introduction, but that can go wrong too. There's different ways of trying to connect and being ingratiated with the other person, but you got to find some way of connecting. Once you are connected, right, there's this thing about setting context. There's, um, you know, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You initiate it somehow. Now, they may do it for you, but a lot of times, you know, if you're over a beer and you just say, like, uh, hey, I heard uh, that you can draw things with AI now. If you're in the right context, the people will start talking about it. They'll start sharing libraries. They'll tell you what's going on. If you're in an elevator, which uh, a friend of mine was recently with a person who invented um, angel investing, right? You have your pitch ready, get to the point quickly. But not every context is the same. There's a way to talk in that specific context. Then you just listen. This is the part that everybody forgets. Everybody has that person that needs to get out every single little detail about their platform. And in the end, you end up saying nothing, and they say everything. You don't talk at people. It's an exchange, right? That's, if you don't hear them, you don't know how to relate yourself to them. Um, eventually, you build on this stuff, okay, uh, and you take what you've learned before, you build on that conversation, 
and but eventually you can't talk to everybody all the time. Um, you have to choose who you want to talk to and why. You have to evaluate that relationship and start the entire, pro entire process over. But no matter what you do, engage, engage, engage. Thank you. All right. Now we have the same presentation from Raul Gutta. Hello, Round of applause for Raul. Hello, everybody. My name is Rahul Gupta, and hello. Uh, my name is Rahul Gupta, and uh, I'll be talking uh, about understanding large code bases. How many of you have you ever dealt with large code bases? Wow, that's like everybody. So, how big, how large of a code base we are talking about? So, uh, there was a, a, a article published in Wired a couple of uh, years ago that Google's uh, search engine code base is about two billion lines of code. And that's, if you have a file containing 500 lines, that's two million files, and that's a lot. And especially when you're uh, working on large code bases, it's, uh, it's hard to wrap your head around how each of the component is linked to each other. So that's kind of like idea uh, of the problem. And we have like a lot of micro level tools to help us understand what each function is doing and what a specific uh, component of the code is doing. So we have uh, you know, static, type, static typing to understand how the input and output of a particular unit look like. And we have debuggers like PDB or IPDB to which will kind of, uh, we, can uh, we can see the out input and output line by line and understand what each of those line is doing. And then we have other profilers which can help us understand how the program is interacting with uh, uh, the operating system. But we don't have a lot of tool to help us understand how the, the bigger picture of a software, understand how each of the component is interacting with other component in, the, uh, in your software. So a couple of months ago, I was uh, planning to give a I was giving, I was preparing a talk on request and how each of the uh, kind of understand request at high level and how each of the component is related to the, uh, uh, the other. And one of the, two of the tools that I found useful, one of them was tree that would list down uh, the folder structure of your package. And sometimes your code is like neatly organized into uh, a, fi a directory structure. And that's, that's kind of like uh, how you start understanding uh, each of the components that are organized in your code base. And the other one is PyReverse, which is, uh, which is a tool that comes with PyLint. If you have PyLint installed on your machine, it just comes for free. What it does, it actually consumes, it takes uh, your module as an input and all the classes and, uh, classes and uh, files as an input, and it would output a graph a uh, graph containing all the classes and their interaction between these uh, classes. So if you are familiar with UML, UML diagram, that's, uh, it, it does a little bit of that. It will become more clear in the next slide. So this is the uh, UML diagram for uh, request library. There are four things I want to call, call out here. So each of these blocks here, let's uh, pick this one. It has three components. So in the top, it's the name of the class which has, uh, it's the name of the class. The second block is uh, all the attribute that a particular class has and their corresponding type. And the third component is uh, uh, the member function that a particular class has. So that kind of give you understanding of what, a, what does a class contain and what it can do for you. And the next thing is we have uh, two types of arrows here. So that's a relationship between a subclass and the parent class. So you can see the inheritance hierarchy of uh, classes in your software. And the second thing is this relationship. It's a has a relationship. So if a class has an instance of, uh, it has a, a member which is instance of other class, you would have this arrow. And once you have this, th there's a lot more detail into it. I wouldn't uh, go into all that. But the key takeaway from this graph is that you, you get all your components in one place, and you can discover the relationship between all these components and understand um, 
how each of those components interact with each other and get a little bit more insight into your software. Of course, uh, it's not a magic bullet. There might be, uh, there will be like a lot of other tools that you would need to do in order to uh, uh, learn more about it. Uh, hopefully, I'll uh, yeah. This will do. Uh, this will cl clarify some of the things for you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. And our next speaker is Dennis O'Brien from GSN Games. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. Oops, see, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, and what are you, you going to be speaking to us about? Uh, categorical variables in machine learning. Machine learning. Sounds yeah. fun. <laughs> Important word. <laughs> what about machine learning and games together? Sure. All uh, right. This might just be about how do you make a... Uh, um, so jokes, jokes, yeah. jokes. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Does anyone have a joke? Today? Here we are. Well, so... Um, I've got these free books to give away. They're they're ebooks, but it's Pearson's entire Python library. Yeah. Okay. So uh, um, okay. I'm just gonna say the first four people who raise their hand will get a book if I can. Well, we got a lot. Okay. Maybe this was. Uh... Yeah. No, no, wait, wait. Someone has to say a joke. You want a book? Say a joke. Code of conduct approved joke. Okay. Here it is. What's your name? Uh, Nick. Nick, go ahead. Why couldn't the bicycle stand up? Too tired. Oh. <laughs> okay, I got the screen going. Okay, All right, thanks. Four minutes. All right, thanks. I like a challenge. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm talking about. Um, uh, categorical variables in machine learning projects. So this is going to be a, a survey, and even more of a whirlwind survey now. Uh, that's not fun. Okay. Um, okay. This might just be about how do you make a Linux desktop share its screen across um, another, uh, <laughs> which, what's that? Uh, uh, yes, let's see. Can you just mirror it? Uh, sort of a uh, <laughs> okay. It's mirrored. All right. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm not going to go full screen. That might have been too much for it. Yeah, okay. Okay, so what are categorical? Three minutes. Okay, so what are categorical variables? Uh, just any non numerical feature you have in your model. Like an example here is state, or um, I work in video games for mobile games, so the device type might be one. Uh, it may or may not be orderable. Like if you have age buckets, then that's orderable. If you have just a device model or some name like that, not necessarily. Um, uh, a model, and then, oh, oh, okay, I guess I have like even less time, like Ubuntu is giving me 30 seconds to um, share my, uh, to, yeah, <laughs> okay, oh, I know what it is, there's a screen somewhere that's saying, do you want to accept this? Oh, keep it, Jesus. Keep the okay, all right. Wow. Okay. Now I've got two minutes. Okay. So uh, they're often they they have a lot of information, but they're challenging to use sometimes um, for various reasons. I'll get into that. Um, so one option is one-hot encoding. So you take your one column, and for every uh, level that it can take on, you make a new column that's either a one or a zero. Uh, the great thing about that is that it can be handled by almost any kind of learning algorithm, whether it's a linear linear model, or um, a maximum margin model, or a tree-based model. Uh, easy to interpret, too. Uh, but the bad downside is that uh, you can have really sparse features. Um, you can use a lot of memory, and the sparsity can actually degrade the model performance. Uh, another option is label encoding. So now, if I had, say, Android phone, Android tablet, iPhone, uh, I, I substitute those for one, two, three, four. Still just one column. Um, the uh, the pro here is that it works well in practice, even though uh, one and two might not necessarily be less than three and four. Um, for tree-based models, it can work pretty well. Uh, the downside is, is when you have really high cardinality, that just doesn't work. Um, 
and it's harder to interpret your model. Uh, there's a lot of other um, techniques. Rank encoding is one where you, um, you might say this category is number one or the top percentile. Uh, proxy encoding would be instead of saying uh, US, I might say what's the GDP of the US. Cyclical encoding is where you take sine and cosine of things. Um, so there's a great library here, categorical encoding is part of Scikit Contrib. Uh, take a look at it, it's great documentation. Uh, Catboost is uh, a newish um, tree-based uh, gradient boosted model that uh, handles classifiers right out of the um, out of the gate. Uh, sorry, it handles categoricals. Uh, Scikit-learn so NoCats is something that's been in a pull request for three years, but I'm hoping that it'll get into 0 0.20. Um, and then in deep learning, um, you have an option of doing uh, embedding spaces. So much like what Katie was talking about uh, with word embeddings, you can also just make an embedding, um, and it will take your, say, if you have 100 different levels, it'll make it into a lower dimensional space, and you can understand it and visualize it. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Our next speaker has already uh, given an amazing talk yesterday. Uh, he works at UCF, not UCSF. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Brian, I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah. Okay, let's do this. Uh, yeah, I'm a professor at University of San Francisco. Uh, yeah, so I uh, teach data science, but I enjoy geeking out like everyone, so we're gonna geek out on Fibonacci sequences. So let's go for a ride. So if you don't know what a Fibonacci sequence is, it's a numerical sequence where we take one number and we take another number, we take those two numbers, add them together, and we get the next number in line. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna keep sliding that window and we're gonna start generating numbers. And you're gonna see that this is gonna grow real fast. It's gonna get big fast, it's called geometric sequence. So one plus one, two, one plus two, three, five, keep going like that. Where do we see this? All over the place. All over math, uh, including nature. So we can see that in uh, a shell. We can see it on bigger scales, uh, like hurricanes and galaxies. We can also see it in unnatural contexts also. <laughs> so uh, how do we do that in uh, Python? So shout out ways that you would calculate that in Python, or generate that sequence in Python. Oh, I like that one. What else? What? SciPy signal. Sci signal, nice. That's a good one. What else? As a string? Static gen Okay, we can see that. Okay, so here are the ways I'm going to go through real quick. We're going to do these. So let's explore these real quick. So, like all good programmers, I start with a test suite. So I made a little test suite where I give in uh, an index, and I'm supposed to get back a value. Well, and you can see that this thing gets real big real quick. So I'm going to hold and reserve a big one. So like that in, in the, setting, the 30 second one is up up around 21 million. So I'll hold that in reserve. Let's fire that up. Is that going to fire? There it is, firing, excellent. Uh, and so let's do it recursively. So here we go, here's a nice little recursive function. So we're gonna call ourselves uh, twice to get the next value. And we can take a peek at that. Oh, that works, I like it. So that looks good. Uh, let's test it, does it pass our test suite? Yes, passes our test suite, we're happy. Let's run it on the big value. Ooh, that's taking a little bit of time. Ooh, we don't like that. How can we do it better? Yeah, dynamic programming, awesome. So we're not gonna repeat all those calculations, we're gonna cache them. Caching is one of the best ideas in computer science. So whenever you can, cache values. So we're lucky, that's built into Python. So I'm gonna go, go grab that from Funk Tools and get a little bit of a cache. I'm gonna use that as a decorator and I'm just gonna wrap up my old recursive function in this decorator and it's gonna cache the values. And so now I can run the test. Now I'm gonna try it on that big value Ooh, that's fast. Ooh, I like fast and accurate. We're doing well. Let's keep moving. We can also do it as a series of overlapping subproblems. So you could just think about it as having a, a big list, and we're just gonna slide through the list and look at the last two items to give us the new item. And so that's what we do right here. We have a little list to kick it off, and then we're just gonna step through that list and then return the value that we need. So we run the test suite. Ooh, that's also fast, fast and accurate. Oh, but let's think about a little bit of analysis. The time complexity is linear. So bigger numbers, it's gonna take us a little longer. We also have a pretty scary space complexity. We're just gonna keep that list of numbers and it's gonna go bigger and bigger and bigger. So our memory demands are also gonna grow as that function is called. We don't want that. 
So what we're going to do is we do a little bit of optimization. We only need to keep the last two values. So what I'm going to do is just swap out those last two values and then stop that function whenever I need that value. So I'm not storing all of the historical values. I'm just storing the history that I need, which is the last two values. Ooh, fast and accurate. I like that also. OK, so what's the best big O time complexity for the computer science students in the audience? Constant, yes, let's see that. Constant time, ooh, back up. Constant time for math operations are the closed form solutions. Oh, we can go on the internet and look up a closed form solution. We have the beautiful and elegant Binet formula. And uh, it's just gonna get, we pump in the end value, end value, and then out comes the uh, value we want. So a very crude, crude implementation of it in Python is right there, um, but there it is fast and accurate in constant time. So there we are, good deal. Now we're gonna get strange. Let's do it the functional way. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna switch over and we're not gonna do functions. We're gonna go into the strange land of generators. So what we're gonna do is store the state and we're just gonna ask for that back. So instead of returning the state, we're gonna do that. So we have a little generator function. Let's load that up into memory. And then what we're gonna do is go into the iter tools library grab i slice, which is for iterator slice. I'm gonna reach in there and get this. What happens is I can go up to huge numbers and it'll be, it'll be right there. Wait, oh, that's too big, but it'll work. It'll work, it'll work real big. Thank you, Brian. All right, we have a mid-time announcement while Simon sets up his computer. Hi, everybody. Very quick announcement. As we learned from our keynote today, the Python data community is growing enormously. There are PyData meetup groups all around the world, but until now, there has not been a PyData meetup group in San Francisco, which is a little strange. There actually was one, but it became defunct, but we're bringing it back. We're going to have our first kickoff meetup on September 6th. We're going to learn about managing the machine learning lifecycle with MLflow. We're going to learn about data visualization for scientific discovery. Please Google the San Francisco PyData meetup group, join the meetup group, and come to our kickoff. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Final one is five minutes. OK. Um, so uh, I'm sure nobody, nobody's heard about this talk because it's been very small news, but there may have been some Russian influence on the election that was held in this country um, quite recently. And um, one of the things, the fascinating things coming out of this is some of the data that's now being released that, that sh tries to help us pick out what actually happened. Um, the House uh, Select Committee on Intelligence, the, mi the House minority, released a whole bunch of files recently that were given to them by Facebook as part of their investigation. And these files were all of the Facebook ads that the Russian Internet Research Agency had purchased over the duration of the election. And so top, um, you know, top, top props to them for releasing this data. Unfortunately, they're a government group, so they released the data as zip files full of PDFs. So here we go, a whole bunch of zip files full of PDFs. You download one of those, it's a bunch of PDFs. If you look at the individual PDFs, they've got the actual Facebook ad and then a whole bunch of really interesting information like the landing page, what it was linked to, how many impressions it got, and then most interesting of all, who the targeting op what targeting options were used. So who was targeted with this ad using Facebook's incredibly sophisticated ad, ad targeting. So it's PDFs in the zip files. That's not great. Um, a chap called Ed Summers did an incredible job of taking that data and running PDF extraction um, libraries and all of this sort of stuff against it to turn it from a bunch of PDFs into actual real data that you can use. And he produced a file called ads.json, which is all three and a half thousand of these ads um, as a lovely JSON file with um, a breakdown of the targeting and all of that kind of stuff. I got really excited about this because I love data. Um, and I used my open source tool data set, which if you missed my talk early, you'll have no idea what this is, but, but look it up later. I promise you it's really, really interesting. Um, I used data set and I took that JSON and I converted it into a SQLite database and then I published it online with an interface so that people could actually search it. So here's the thing I built. Um, I'm gonna search for uh, cops and see all of the Facebook ads that mentioned cops. There are 122 of them. I can order by the number of impressions. So 
This is the Facebook ad that got the most impressions that mentioned cops. It was this text, there's the image there. And I can also see the targeting. So this was targeted at people who use third-party apps and websites on mobile devices, um, aged 18 to 65 plus. That's not a particularly interesting targeting thing. But if you dig into the targeting, you can actually look at the most common targeting groups that the Russian Internet Research Agency was using. Um, and they, it's, uh, interestingly, people who match interests African-American history and interests Martin Luther King came up in a whole, but were used for a whole bunch of different adverts. Because it turns out that the, um, there's an actual website that they were sponsoring, spo that a website they were supporting, which claimed to be news of interest to African Americans in the USA, was totally owned by this Russian agency. And so I think they were using it to try and drive down the vote by demoralizing people. But anyway, um, this tool is available online right now. You can use it to search for ads, order, order by ads, try and understand what was going on. Um, because it's running on my data set tool, everything that you can see here is exportable as JSON or as CSV. And if you're interested in learning more, including the source code for how I built all of this, um, take a look at simonwilson.net. It's all on my blog. Uh, thank you very much. All right. Fantastic. And the data set is a really cool tool. Uh, Simon already shared his wisdom at SF Python, which is the the Python San Francisco meetup. And our next speaker is Raul Maldonado. Raul, yeah. All right. Cool. And uh, Raul is going to got a, got a, gonna code. OK. All right, Raul, you have five minutes. Are you ready to start? Or I should, I should never say that question. Um, give me one sec. Oh, no. All right, five minutes. Okay, it's split screen. Uh. All right. Cool. So, um, yeah, so I'll be talking about um, how information is transferred through um, in between networks, um, either through heterogeneous or homogeneous networks, um, through um, and um, how that's done either through certain types of uh, um, pro protocols. So, was, um, and then I'll kind of do, um, I'll just do an um, overview of um, protocol buffers, JSON, and then XML. XML, there's other um, implementations. But let me get started momentarily. Yeah, so um, we would like to, uh, um, transmit information over networks to avoid, int um, either avoid um, where um, high intensive uh, CPU ex executions um, due to like a high di um, indigestion of information or data, and or maybe um, in some cases um, ensure um, some information isn't linked out, um, and that will be kind of discussed in the next slide. So um, one uh, scenario for um, for using a, uh, um, a an encoding format for um, transferring information is a protocol buffer created by Google. Um, it's a binary encoding format um, and and it's very efficient for that um, uh, communication between networks. Um, facts: It's uh, schema based um, in one file in a dot proto file. Um, and uh, fields um, can be introduced um, or introduced and then also be deprecated IDs with, um, as you see to your right, you'll see a dot kind of proto um, typical format where the uh, integer values are just um, flags. Um, and, then, um, and then just above that, there um, a data type object uh, like above message person is created and then those uh, columns for that like for that um, that data type is um, instantiated, and how these um, protocol buffers are um, executed in that visual diagram to the far upper right is the proto is um, the code uh, generated, compiled into a certain file type, and then that um, that uh, information is then transferred over the wire through um, yeah through the network, and then we have a uh, JSON um, 
type uh, structuring data. It's more human readable. Um, you can use keys and values um, um, yeah, um, to create this type of um, object and transfer that information throughout the wire. This is a, uh, um, between networks. Um, and uh, just a slight note that JavaScript object is not JSON, and then JSON is not JavaScript um, only object. So there's like that distinction there. I want to, um, um, yeah, bring. And then lastly, um, XML extensible, extensible markup language um, uses tags and attributes as in compare um, in comparison with um, the JSON object, which uses um, keys and um, values. Um, and here you can see it's a lot more verbose um, in comparison to that to JSON. And, and this is where JSON kind of shines is um, because it's, it lacks in that um, robust format, you save more information in your, um, in those objects and um, for like large, large data sets or whatever, you save like memory over time and as you transfer through um, these networks and that should be it. Oh, oh no! So as comparison um, and contrast, um, discuss that um, in, in these past few minutes. If you have more questions, you can let me know. If I left out something, you can also shine that light on me. Um, other communication protocols: uh, Apache Thrift, eProsima Fast Buffers, SGML, a predecessor that of XML, I believe. And yeah, resources and contact information. That's pretty much it. Thank you, Raul. All right, we have our last lightning speaker today, but we have more lightning speakers at 4.50. So after the conference, remember, we're still doing one more hour of lightning talks. That's 10 more lightning talks. We like lightning talks. We like lightning talks, absolutely. Thank you. What's, what's your name? Max. Max. Uh, Max is great. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right. Max, I don't know what you're going to be speaking about, but go ahead. <laughs> All right. You got five minutes. Sure. So uh, uh, I recently got into machine learning, and I know uh, looking at it like a year ago, maybe I could relate with a lot of people in that you see these presentations, and you're like, how do I do that, or how do I get started? So I wanted to kind of give you the fast course in jumping in and some references and show you an example. And so that's what this will be about. So there's, there's lots of different things you can choose. And I'll give a slide at the end, just uh, some summary of tools you should check out and resources you should check out. But let's jump over to the Jupyter Notebook. <laughs> it's not actually live because it can't connect to my cloud GPU. But I ran it a bit ago, and uh, it's. Just an exercise in uh, does something gent. So if, uh, if uh, I just feed it different pictures, and I use this tool, uh, Google Image Downloader, Google Images Download. You can just Google that and find it. But it's a cool tool. You can just pull images from a search off Google, put them in a folder. So I used that, and I pulled a bunch of images. Uh, you can see how I kind of organized it here. But I just had two things, like hamburger, hot dog. So I had a does gent, does not gent, and I populated the does gent with guitars of more than seven strings or seven strings. Everything else went in the does not gent. So just kind of goofing around and seeing what happens. And so one of the cool things, that I'm using PyTorch, by the way, and is looking at, uh, this kind of goes with a talk on model interpretability. But if we just take a look, okay, it's trained up, and we see some things that have correctly classified, we see that things that gent, so my mouse, yeah, my mouse cursor shows. So if it's close to zero, it gents. If it's close to one, it doesn't. So we see, okay, here's some random things, and it looks okay. And then it's interesting to see, look at the false failures as well as false positives, and see, like, what's the most true and what's the most false. So if we just take a look, like, wow, these guitars really gent. So they're all getting close to zero. It's, it's learned something, right? And then if we look at ones that are uh, most non genty we look, okay, seems to be about right. And uh, it's kind of interesting if you look at uh, the false failures or just false things like type one, type two errors, we see, okay, it's not actually looking at the number of guitar strings. So we come back to that interpretability problem. And it seems like it's maybe going off the color of the guitar or things like that. 
And there's a lot of details there, but I'll jump to uh, back to the keynote. So if you want to uh, do this on your own, I highly recommend the Fast AI course. Really awesome. Rachel Thomas gave a presentation. She's the co-author of it. And just some other tools if you are interested or want to write them down. Um, Fast AI, PyTorch, really recommend those. And then Paper Space is a really good place to run your GPU on. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. OK, so I have. I'm going to give away two more book vouchers. These are for any, the entire Pearson Python series. Uh, so maybe, uh, I don't know, how about we do the first two people who come up to me after the talk and find me. I'm going to hide somewhere. But thanks. <laughs> and I'll give away six more at the next Lightning Talk session. I think I ought to give all these away. Thank thanks. you. Ladies and gentlemen, we've done 10 Lightning Talks in like one hour, all right? Yeah. All right.